My name is Abigail Boyer, Associate Executive Director of Programs for the Cleary Center for Security on campus, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. We're really glad that you were able to join us today, so I just want to go through a few logistics before I introduce you to our panelists. In addition to a question and answer period at the end, we are also going to have some moments that are interactive where we'll look to get some feedback or thoughts from all of you. We encourage you to interact with us by typing in the questions and comments um, using the questions pane. If you have any questions or technical problems throughout the webinar, my colleague Amy is also connected and can help navigate those. We'll be recording today's session and you'll receive a link to the recording within 48 hours that will be available on our YouTube page. So we are absolutely thrilled to have with us three amazing panelists. First, we have Andre LeDuc. His professional and applied research is focused on the development of community and organizational resilience. LeDuc is the executive director of the University of Oregon Enterprise Risk Services Unit. He also developed and administers the National Disaster Resilience University's Drew Network. LeDuc has a proven history of working successfully with executive leadership, emergency services, and risk management professionals, academics, and private sector representatives on diverse and complex hazard and risk-related projects and policy issues. We've been really fortunate to work with Andre on a number of different webinars in the past, and we're really happy that he was able to join us again for this one. Dr. Roger Sorokti is the Senior Associate for Higher Education in the Center for Conflict Dynamics at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. Prior to this role, he spent 41 years in higher education, predominantly as a student affairs administrator, with more than half of that time as a vice president for student affairs. He retired in 2013 after serving 12 years as the VP for Enrollment and Student Services at the University of Tulsa. Earlier this year, he and a colleague co-authored a book published by Josie Bass entitled Risk Management and Student Affairs, Foundations for Safety and Success. Lastly, but not least, Craig E. Rundy is the director of the Center for Conflict Dynamics at Eckerd College. He oversees training and product development on the center's array of conflict management products, including the Conflict Dynamics Profile Assessment Instrument, the Becoming Conflict Competent Skills Development Course, and the Mediation Training Institute's Portfolio portfolio of workplace mediation courses. Craig is the co-author of several books on workplace conflict management, including Becoming a Conflict Competent Leader, Building Conflict Competent Teams, and Developing Your, Your Conflict Competence, public, uh, published by uh, Josie Bass as part of the Center for Creative Leadership series. So just a little bit more about us and why we decided to do this webinar. So our team at the Cleary Center is in the process of organizing this year's National Campus Safety Awareness Month campaign. And so during our needs assessment to try to get a better sense from institutions as to what content would be most helpful, on um, what people are looking to see, the need for collaboration really came up over and over. And just to give you some context, the idea for National Campus Safety Awareness Month was presented to the Cleary Center, um, which was then secured Security on campus by a group of University of Wisconsin Green Bay students in 2005. And it was really designed to help highlight potential safety issues during a month in which institutions typically see an increase in crime um, and to really use September as the start of a year-long conversation about how everyone within the campus community can contribute to a safer campus. And so we as an organization are committed to using the month as another opportunity that can give institutions free resources that are no cost to them that address some of the pressing needs within their own community and some of the trends that we're seeing nationally. Um, and it's really meant to help bulk some of their, um, some of institutions' prevention and response efforts. So this year we're continuing a campaign that we started last year, which is called No More, Do More, which is really focused on providing intentional professional development opportunities, such as webinars like this one, that institutions can access during the month of September and beyond. So we'll plug a link to that in case you're interested. Again, it's um, it's at no cost to the institutions. We really just want to create content that we think is helpful um, based on the feedback that we get from all of you. So we'll put that in um, so that you can access that. But that really ties into this webinar here today. So we wanted to start out by just getting a sense from you. Why do you think talking about teams is so crucial at this moment? Why would we bring up this topic and why are we going to talk about it now? So as I mentioned on the right side of your computer, you'll see a chat area, um, a questions area where you can just plug in your own thoughts and your own ideas. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing those and then we'll, we'll share a bit. All right.
So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So really looking at, we know that um, collaboration really gives us the opportunity to get more thoughts, more feedback from other folks in our community. Collaboration and administration buy-in is crucial. So not only from the folks that we might be working with on a team, but getting that support from leadership and getting buy-in from leadership. Holistic approach to resolution is a more comprehensive perspective. Um, so one of the things that we talk a lot about at our organization is really that idea of crowdsourcing. So are we getting thoughts and ideas and feedback from people who may have different perspectives and different ideas than what we might bring to the table? Um, teams are necessary to actually formulate a plan before um, addressing any sort of effort. So making sure that you know the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, bridging student affairs, academics, administration, so bringing those different folks together. Absolutely. So really, really great feedback and, and certainly in line with some of the things that we're seeing and hearing in the work that we're doing. And that is exactly with why we wanted to address this topic because as an organization, we travel nationally talking to institutions, working with institutions for training and for some of our other initiatives. And a common theme that we kept on seeing was institutions are dealing with a number of different um, people and ideas within a sphere. So um, on the screen in front of you, you see just a, a couple of the different things that institutions are working with right now in terms of how they respond to campus sexual assault, for example. Um, how do we prepare for if there are threats to our campus community? Um, how do we we communicate so that people know about our initiatives? How do we respond to the media um, when they're asking about an event on campus? And so as they navigate all of those things and as they're looking to be in compliance with a number of different laws in addition to that, one of the patterns that we were finding is that a challenge for a lot of institutions was almost less about not understanding technical elements and more about how do we make sure that we have teams that can work together effectively. So it was almost as though a lot of the problems that we were identifying were not necessarily technical problems, but more in a sense of um, challenges in communicating with others and really building um, effective, powerful working relationships. And so that's really what we wanted to touch on today. Um, and so Andre's going to address a little bit more, you know, some of these uh, buzzwords or some of these things that we hear around teams. Um, and so for us, uh, and you can see on the screen, when people think about working in a team, a lot of times, uh, certainly there are a lot of strengths to that, but they also think about some of the challenges. On the screen are some of the some of the feedback that we got from our needs assessment for National Campus Safety Awareness Month, and a lot of the challenges that people talked about is less about the technical, as you can see, and more about how do we make sure we have the right people at the table? How do we accommodate different um, learning styles and working styles and really find the strength in all of that? So our goal for today is to really give you some tangible takeaways, some tangible things that you're going to be able to do to hopefully have your teams maybe work together more effectively and hopefully give us a chance within this space to learn from one another. So if you have feedback as we go through some of these different areas and you say this is what's been working for me, I'd encourage for you to plug that into the um, the side panel so that we can talk about that as well. So we're going to go through a, a number of different areas, but we'll also leave some time for questions and answers at the end where hopefully we can learn more from you and you can learn more from us. So I'm going to hand it over to Andre who's going to talk just a little bit about some of these buzzwords that we hear when talking about teams. So thank you so much for joining us, Andre. Thank you and, and thank you for, um, you know, covering this topic because I do think that it's a, an important topic and one of the reasons that I wanted to start the discussion with uh, what I call buzzwords or things that we throw around and it was interesting to hear um, you know people that are on, on the line some of their feedback and why we feel we need teams you know we again hit things like well we need a group effort we need to be multidisciplinary interdisciplinary uh, we establish working groups and we work collaboratively um, but on the next slide, what I really want to go back to is, well, what's the foundation? Meaning, we say these words, we throw them out pretty liberally to say, we have a problem, let's, let's address it. Um, but we never really, I think, take the time to step back and say, what's really in some of these words? And so, the, what I call the three C's continuum that you see on your screen right now, I think is a really important slide that, that I spend a lot of time with leadership, uh, whether that's on campus or cities, state level to say that before we start a project, let's look at where are we and what are we asking of each other. 
in that when you try to define the three C's that we throw around, whether that's communicate, coordinate, or collaborate, they actually have a tied meeting to them that we need to understand. Otherwise, we can't expect that the end result is going to get us to where we want to go um, if we look at, hey, let's just communicate and expect that we're going to have some great collaboration at the end. That each phase requires a different type of thought in how you structure your process. So I want to kind of step us through that, again, we, we all talk about communication, but when you think about communication, really that's an informal relationship. Right now I'm communicating with you. Um, I'm sharing information. Uh, there really you know, might be a, a def defined mission, but really on this it's an objective of I'm going to share information with you. You're maybe going to take it, maybe you're not. Uh, but the key is that my resources are mine, your resources are you that we're not sharing resources and there's kind of a, a anonymous authority is retained, meaning that you're not giving up any authority um, or roles or responsibilities. It purely is a transfer of information. And it's important to note, and you'll notice on the bottom of all of these columns um, as we build, that to communicate really has virtually no risk uh, in the sense of me sharing information, depending on what that information is, um, has, has very little risk. But as we move up in kind of group dynamics to the concept of coordination, this is where we're starting to kind of think a little bit more formally about a formal relationship and understanding what is the mission of the various players or group that we're bringing together and do we have a shared mission? Have we start set objectives? Have we kind of started looking at how are we going to communicate between different channels? As Abby had stated, do we have the right people at the table? And a lot of that is you're now starting to think that if you want a true collaboration, um, you need to kind of have more pieces in part in, in to kind of look at how you're organizing the group. And you're also starting to move down this, this realm of kind of um, the rewards are shared, but the risk increases. So it's both shared reward, but you're also starting to do shared risk. And as you get to what I would call the, the big C, which again, you hear a lot about collaboration, True collaboration is a more durable relationship. It's, it's when separate organization, organizations are brought together in kind of one structure. So you have a task force, you've developed a team. But again, if you have not set a very clear vision and mission of what that group is supposed to be collaborating on, you cannot expect to have great results. And usually that's where you're going to have tension in how the team is defined and structured. So once you're to that collaboration, you have to have well-defined communication on all levels. So understanding roles, responsibilities, what each member is contributing in the sense of, you know, resources or reputation. Um, so sometimes collaborations don't work because uh, just having that affiliation might have reputational issues for an organization or a group. And collaboration structure, uh, need, you need to determine the authorities. You need to kind of set out how are we organizing this, who has what authorities, and again, what you're starting to do is you're partnering and pooling resources. So that end result is that there's going to be um, shared rewards again, but there's also shared risk and there's much greater risk. And so again, I like to use the three C's as it's a really good way that I found of when you're starting off a committee, a work group, a task group, a team of kind of where are we? What are we trying to achieve here? Are we just getting together to communicate, coordinate, or are we trying to collaborate? And it's okay to be in one of those uh, areas, the most important part is defining what are you trying to do, because if it is true collaboration, then that's going to take more energy and effort, and you'll hear throughout the rest of today's webinar ways that you can approach that. So the, the next slide kind of addresses, so again, why do we have to address this? And I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the work of Jeffrey Luke um, and the a book that he developed, and there's actually a, a leadership group that uh, still runs up here in Oregon um, around how do we deal with strategies for an interconnected world and kind of the concept of catalytic leadership? And the premise here is that, you know, urgent problems are intertwined with uh, other issues. They cross traditional boundaries and they're difficult to define, analyze, and permanently solve. I don't know if this sounds familiar to anybody from a university setting, but I, I know this in the sense that not not only are the problems interconnected, but the problem solving activities occur in a context of fragmentation and shared power. And the bottom line is no one organization, jurisdiction, uh, department on a campus site or sector has enough power and uh, to, you know, dictate solutions unilaterally. So, I mean, the way that the world is framed and the complexity when you start to think about compliance and you start to think about safety and all the things that are wrapped up into that, the only way to succeed is we have to 
partner. We have to start looking at how do we actually uh, work together. And so a lot of the things that we've been working on um, at the university, and in the next slide we'll kind of define one of our, our case studies that we're going to thread throughout today's uh, webcast, is we really consciously think about what are the teams that we're trying to put together here on campus um, to help push an initiative forward or address uh, complex and difficult problems. Um, and so the example that we're going to be talking or the case study that we'll talk about today and I'll interject throughout um, the rest of the session is our, our newly formed uh, behavioral evaluation and, and threat assessment team or what we call the beta team. This team was actually developed off of uh, another team that we've been running on campus for over uh, seven years, which is our incident management team um, in dealing with any type of crisis or emergency. But it has a very specific purpose. And again, I think it's germane to the, the topics that we're all facing and that I know the Clery Center works on. That the purpose of our behavioral threat, uh, behavioral evaluation and threat assessment team, is it exists to mitigate behavioral threats on campus through an integrated process of communication, education, prevention, problem identification, assessment, intervention, response and response to incidents. And again, that's a mouthful. There's a lot there. But what it also means is that we need to have a team that cuts across a lot of the different divisions on campus, a lot of the different leadership groups to come together so when we see a potential threat, and so these are the threats where we might have um, you know, threatening behavior from a student, faculty, staff, or community member that could pose a risk to our campus. How do we pull that information together uh, in a secure, sensitive uh, way because it's, it's delicate information we have to deal with, but also in a timely way that we know um, all the information that we do so that we can make a, a good decision based upon that data to protect the campus. And again, throughout uh, today's session, I'll be chiming in with different ways that we're working to develop this team to make it productive. And I'll turn it back over to Abby. Excellent. So, so we're really going to walk through some of those key areas that um, during the, the assessment people identified as some of their challenges. And we're really just going to talk through what are the challenges that we're seeing, some of which, you know, it's really great. I'm seeing a lot of you share additional feedback in that questions pane as Andre is talking, which is, which is really wonderful. And so one of the, the um, things that comes up is really looking at do we have clear goals and what is our process for forming this team and making sure that it's effective. So we'll go through and identify some of those key challenges and then walk through action items. So after we go through an action item, Andre is then going to bring back in that case study to really talk about, okay, we, we're talking about this in theory. What does this look like in application and in practice? Um, so first, Andre is just going to share a little bit, which he touched on a, a bit already, about why do we need that team and how do we make sure that we have a clear goal for the purpose of that team. So thanks. And again, um, the, basically what we need to do is look at how do we set up a team to succeed. And so some of the basic premises is that first and foremost, is there a purpose statement or a charter? And again, who, who approved that? Um, so a lot of times we get together and form groups to solve problems. But are they connected, meaning is it connected to our leadership or connected at the right level within the organization? Um, and, and what are the expectations of the members of the team? And so first is, you know, is there a, a purpose or a charter for the team or the group that you're working with? What's the process for determining if a team or meeting is needed? And we'll talk about this again throughout the day in the sense of often I think it's easy in a collaborative environment and uh, in a college or university setting that we just get people together to talk. Uh, but, you know, what, what is really the purpose behind bringing people together and not over meeting uh, them to death? And then, you know, what will you do once the issue has been addressed? And so this is a really important part around kind of an exit strategy. I'm sure all of us on the phone are on different committees or groups that we're wondering, hmm, why am I still on this? Did we ever really address the issue? Or if we've come to closure, what is our exit strategy? So the action items really around this are, you know, establishing a purpose and a reason, identifying the authority and who the team leader is, what those roles and responsibilities are, and then setting expectations. So that's very clear for everybody that is actually on the team. They know this is what is expected of me and that I, I am to show up and, and do my part 
Um, and again, if those things aren't defined at the front end, it's very difficult to expect that you're going to have a successful team uh, to either address the problem or be ready when you have a problem presented that, that they need to work on. Absolutely. And so one of the things that we see bringing the team together, once we've addressed, well, what are we here to do, we also then have to start to figure out, well, how are we going to effectively work together, um, and how are these different kind of roles and responsibilities going to overlap and intersect? And so we started looking at this challenge, which is how do we address different working styles? And I love that when, I, when we were talking about this as a group, um, Craig and Roger really said, Let's talk about this as how do we celebrate different working styles. So they're going to address in terms of all of the different individuals and personalities and preferences that we have um, within our team, how do we make sure that we're kind of honoring all of those and doing so in a way that's what's productive. So Craig and Roger, thank you so much for joining us and, and let's hear a little bit about how you celebrate those styles. Yeah, you know what? It's interesting that uh, even if you get off to a good start with clarity on roles and goals, there's still uh, these challenges of how do you uh, manage and, in fact, celebrate the differences that you have, whether it's differences in styles or, uh, in, the, in the next part, differences in perspectives. Because, in effect, all teams have these differences. And, in effect, you want them to have differences. If everybody was the same and saw things the same, you wouldn't have nearly the dy dynamic quality that you get when the people do bring different uh, uh, qualities to the team. Now, the problem is that when you bring that diversity of uh, style and perspective, you also bring the potential for a clash, in a sense, or conflict, because these differing styles, uh, even inadvertently, can cause frustrations among people. So in some respects, the first thing is to recognize that there will be differences. Those differences can be beneficial to the team, and that's where you begin to celebrate them. If we see things differently, that gives us the ability to bounce ideas off of one another and come up with brand new things that none of us by themselves would have come up with. So in one sense, the recognition is a key that differences are good and that they will help us. Now, that's nice, but it's also tough to actually do that in practice because we all have our own style and we feel like our own style is sort of the right way of going about things. So being able to purposely uh, recognize, not only tolerate, but celebrate the, the differences is one thing, and team leaders can be very important in doing that. Uh, beyond that, making sure that we get uh, feedback from the different people on the team uh, is important and they will bring it in different ways. People who are introverted are going to take a longer time to reflect on issues. They need a little bit of time to uh, consider their response. People who are more extroverted will be very uh, chatty sometimes in the uh, sessions and so leaders need to know how to be able to bring in people who have those different styles. Also, the different styles can actually create uh, irritation in others. We call that hot buttons, where somebody behaves in a certain way and it irritates others in the group, sometimes even uh, almost unconsciously. And so being able to understand how the different people like to work together, what kind of things they don't like, so that you can avoid being able to unnecessarily uh, upset one another becomes very important. Absolutely. And so I think for, you know, one of the things that we talked about is it's really helpful to, to think about what does this look like from a practical standpoint? Because I think so often we talk about, you know, it's important for people to work together. It's important um, to know that, that everyone's on the same page. But then when it actually comes to honoring those styles, it can be a bit more challenging. So Andre, can you share a little bit about for your team? I know you're involved in many, but for the case study in particular, what were some of the different ways that you um, found were helpful in really kind of bringing those different styles and approaches to the table. Yeah, so again, you know, we like, defined what our kind of mission statement or purpose statement was for our, our beta team. And again, the complexity of the issues that we're facing, it was very, very clear that from um, the onset that one of the things that we wanted to adopt and then also make sure that all the members were very clear, plus the leadership that is going to be looking to this team were clear on, was having a set methodology. 
And so when we talk about kind of the differences in working style and, um, and kind of um, different people and, you know, truly celebrating those differences, our, our beta team uh, capitalizes on that. So um, I'll talk a little bit later in this about the members that we have on the team. But because of that diversity and because of having everything from law enforcement to general counsel to student life in one room looking at a very sensitive topic, we understood the importance of setting on or approving and agreeing to a set methodology on how the team would work. And, and so we were able to, and looking at that, we didn't want to create that. We actually looked at national standards for how you do behavioral evaluation and threat assessment and uh, chose one. And then again, worked with our leadership to approve that so that we have, we call kind of our, our guardrails that when we're in the midst of assessing a case, um, we have a set methodology on how we will do that. And again, we celebrate the diversity that the, the members of the, the team are bringing and we need their input, but there's a clear line of how uh, we approach that. And we use the waiver 21 methodology if people are interested, which sets out 21 questions that we need to ask and answer. And that has been very helpful when we have, again, time pressures and very sensitive cases that's very easy to get off track or um, go down rabbit trails we don't want to. It's having that, that guidepost of how you navigate. And so that's, that methodology is important, but then also we've set up, you know, kind of what the roles and responsibilities and expectations are for each, each team member, which has also been really, really helpful um, so that we can kind of self-govern. But those are kind of the two key things that when we look at, we've got to capitalize on, meaning this team is the antithesis of we need a diverse group to look at these situations and share information and they need to be able to trust each other um, that they can openly discuss the issue that that methodology and the guidelines and, and roles and responsibilities are really really critical um, and one of the things that we've set up in that team is I serve as one of the co-chairs we have two co-chairs that are effectively kind of the non-voting members of the committee that our sole job is process our sole job is to make sure that we are following the methodology, uh, we're staying within the lane, um, and encouraging the difference of opinion um, to navigate us through uh, the, the problem solving that the team needs to do. So who's in that kind of project leader and project manager role and, and who's keeping an eye on the process is gonna make a difference. We have some great questions that are coming in um, and some of them relate to the next topic that we were going to address. So I'm going to ask Greg and Roger um, to tackle some of these because um, one of the one of the statements that someone shared, which is powerful and I'm sure many of us can identify with, is how can we be effective as team leaders if we as team leaders can't even get along? Um, and another question that came in was what are some of those individual hot buttons? You know, you referenced um, having some of those, but what might that look like or what, what might some of those triggers be? So I'm going to hand it back over to um, Craig and Roger and if you could just share a little bit about, about those hot buttons and then we can talk a little bit about that group conflict and what that, what that looks like. Those are basically hot buttons, this is Craig, uh, hot buttons are basically behaviors that other people engage in that upset us. There's a wide variety of kinds of things. Uh, some people uh, get upset with um, self-centered behaviors on the part of others, uh, abrasive types of behaviors, people who don't acknowledge uh, the contributions of others. So there are a wide range of things that can trigger irritation in us. And what happens when that occurs is that it makes us more uh, likely to use uh, destructive types of responses, uh, behaviors that will tend to escalate tension and keep people from being able to talk openly and honestly. There are ways around it uh, by being able to, first of all, better understand what your own hot buttons are, and secondly, develop strategies for how you cool those down, how you manage your own emotions. But, Roger? Most of you probably can identify when, when somebody's pushing your hot button. You actually have some physical reaction. Most people have physical reactions to that. Your jaw might start to clench. Your, your neck muscles might start to get tense. You, your, your blood pressure might start to go up. There are real physical reactions to uh, those hot buttons. And if you aren't able to control those, to cool them down, if you will, 
as Craig said, it's likely to uh, impact the, the group in a, in a negative way and, and make the group less effective in, a, in solving uh, the, the problem or the issue that, that, you're, that you're there to address. Unmuted. If you'd like, we could uh, follow up, Abby, and, and uh, those of you listening on the, on the challenge of group conflict, um, because this is so important to everything that, that you've talked about so far. And if you go back to the earlier slide uh, where the survey asked for individuals uh, to identify the biggest challenge in working as a team, differing perspectives um, was the highest uh, one identified, over 40 and a half percent of the respondents identified that as, as a challenge. So the one thing that we, uh, that forms the basis of all the work that we do here at the Center for Conflict Dynamics is that one, conflict is going to be inevitable. It's going to happen, but, and two, conflict should never try to be, you should never try to eliminate conflict because in the end, if conflict can be managed effectively, generally better ideas better solutions come out as a result of people bringing different perspectives to the issue. Uh, in, in all my years in student affairs work, I, I always used to say to, to the people, uh, my colleagues, you know, if we're all sitting around here constantly just shaking our head and agreeing on something, well, we're either, one, not talking about anything that is, is very substantive, or it's something that we're really not interested in. So we look at the notion of, of conflict being helpful, uh, being uh, constructive to the, the overall work that a team does. And so it's important to acknowledge those different styles, as, as Craig said, uh, different hot buttons that can start to take somebody off track. The, the conflict dynamics profile that forms the basis of a lot of the work that we do here helps individuals identify the behaviors that they tend to use when they're involved in a situation that is creating some tension or conflict. And some of those behaviors tend to make the situation better, and others often derail the, the situation. So knowing those different styles, knowing how to approach those, and one of the key issues there is, you've all heard the phrase, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Perspective taking, being able to sit back and try to put yourself in the other person's position to hear what it is he or she is saying and, and where, where it's that phrase, where, where they're coming from. So as, as Andre talked earlier, if you develop some team norms, one of the most critical things is to be able to recognize the value of different perspectives and to recognize when the team might start to move away from uh, what it said they agreed to do. That's this action item of being open and honest in your conversation. And if somebody has a sense that uh, things aren't going the way everyone agreed, that, there, that it's okay to say, but let's pause a minute here and, and see if we can get back on track. Remember what we said about our team norms and how we would go about working together as a team. And we've often used uh, here this notion of a signal. Uh, you find something that sits on the table when you're meeting. And uh, if a team is starting to get off track, if someone's starting to take you in a different direction, sometimes all it takes is pointing to that little prop or cue that you all agreed to and everybody then says, ah, yeah, I remember now, you're right, let's, let's, uh, let's get back on track. Great, and some of these things will certainly be individual to a team. Um, one of those things that, um, or one of the questions that came in was, can a hot button be a red flag that the group is not going in the correct direction? And I know that Craig and uh, Roger really kind of spoke to the fact that those hot buttons are really different for each person. And certainly they may elaborate on that maybe even further in the webinar, but it's something to really look about and to look at in terms of skill building. Um, do we know what our own triggers are so that we can navigate if we are having some of those challenges within this space? And so, Andre, I'd love to get a sense from you from a practical perspective of some of the work that you do. How do you navigate some of um, these issues such as group conflict that that can come up when you're doing really important work. You know, I loved that Craig and Roger really highlighted that conflict in itself isn't a bad thing. And a lot of times it's going to be, you know, a core part of working together as a group, but it's the way that we manage it and the way that we 
figure out how to navigate um, one another and and really respect and honor those differences in perspective that's going to make the difference. So, um, Andre, can you share a little bit about what that looks like for your team in terms of navigating conflict? Yeah, uh, I think that, you know, these are really important issues and I, I completely agree that, you know, I think sometimes we shy away from conflict because we think that it's it's bad. And I always like to say that, yes, you should have a certain level of uncomfortableness or sense of urgency that actually helps motivate and move a group through um, a process. But again, going back to the basics, how do you set that up so that it is successful? And the, the point about, you know, um, is that hot button kind of a signal that, you know, the group isn't working. The way that we look at that is very um, thoughtful in how we pick the leadership of the team and also then what are, you know, as, as we talk about kind of the norms that we expect from the team. And what I can share with you is that, so again, for the case study that we're, we're highlighting, our behavioral evaluation um, and threat assessment team, the two co-chairs uh, are both, um, have, are, they're, we're both certified incident managers, meaning that we have gone through a training to what I say, learn to be the eye of the storm, not the storm. Um, and so we look at how do you pick a person that can lead the team that is not just the highest ranking person in the room, but somebody that actually has the skill set to facilitate. Another part that we look at with our, our team leads for both this team, but then something we encourage all the team members to go through is we have, um, and I'm sure all of you have different professional development programs around uh, managing conflict and or doing problem solving and we encourage our our members to go through a, a course that we offer here at um, campus that isn't ours but um, called crucial accountability and one of the key things out of that 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 training talks about how to diagnose problems and how to basically address them in again a calm and productive fashion and so that's one of those things that again we put on the on the table that one our facilitators are actually trained to be facilitators there it's not just because you're an avp that you're not running that group but that you actually have the skill sets necessary to run the group and navigate through difficult uh, problems and decisions but then also making sure that not only in how you structure the team meaning kind of agendas and norms but that you have a, a set standard of how are we going to address a problem and again our, our diagnosis um, problem solving technique is basically you know six steps to kind of looking at what is this problem is it a problem of motivation you know personal motivation is it a problem of ability meaning the person that's bringing it up doesn't have the ability or the skills that they need to to move it forward um, and and kind of diagnosing so what why is this an issue the other point that I think is really really critical in, in team dynamics is it's easy to sometimes say, well, wow, that person just has kind of a grading personality and I don't, you know, I don't want to listen to them. And again, a good facilitator, um, it's important that we all have our personal bias and we all have our kind of comfort zones. I'm always looking for the individual that is bringing something up that nobody else is agreeing to. And, and as you heard, um, you know, Craig Day and others say that, um, you know, we, we often kind of don't want uh, this conflict that I'm really nervous when a group is all in agreement. I'm usually looking for who is that one person that doesn't agree and then giving them that opportunity to kind of explain why so that again that is in, encompassing that diversity of the team to make sure we've looked at it from every perspective. Because if you start to discount those those people because you think of oh they're just just annoying and they just you know always bring up problems, they'll be the one time that what they're bringing up is actually very vital to the process um, and to solving the problem and you have discounted it. And so it's really important to not discount uh, what people are putting on the table, but give them a process to problem solve it um, and, and kind of move, move them through um, so that we're not automatically just, you know, moving people out of, of a process. So again, the key there is pick facilitators that actually know how to facilitate and run a good meeting. Um, make sure that they have the training and skill level uh, to navigate those. And then also I think with the teams that we develop, we look at training that we require um, our teams to go through and actually if there's an official methodology, learn that for official training and sign off on that. And then if we expect them to have good problem solving skills as a team, send them through a training um, or individually so that again, you have a common language and vocabulary that you can work from when you have those issues uh, present during, during team dynamics. Right. 
someone just um, commented, which I thought was a really good point and ties into what we're saying. Someone said, teams are often made up of individuals at different educational levels, title ranks, and different experience levels. A member with lower title may be intimidated and not speak out with that different point of view. So that kind of ties back to what they were saying a little bit earlier regarding, do you have different structures for gathering feedback? If that person isn't going to be comfortable voicing their thoughts or opinions with that larger group, do you have a way for them to communicate that feedback in a way that it's going to feel comfortable for them until they've spent more time with the group and maybe um, it may be become easier for them to do it within that space. I think it also ties into our next question, which is really who should be at the table, because we know a lot of times conflict can evolve from people who really just aren't exactly clear why they're there or if they should be there. Um, so one of the things that we really want to explore is how do we decide who should be a part of our team or a part of our process? And once that's the case, how do we make sure um, that, that we're bringing the right folks on board? So we're going to turn that over to, to Craig and Roger, who are going to talk a little bit about that. Fairly quickly. Uh, thanks, Abby. I'm going to uh, follow up on this initially. and move through this next slide and, and actually the two after that fairly quickly. These uh, slides all identify again those challenges that, that uh, people identified in the survey that was referenced uh, earlier in the presentation. And uh, to the question that, that you just mentioned as a lead into this, it's so important for the leader of a team or a group to make sure that everybody knows that everyone is there because they have a contribution to make. And yes, I understand a, a new professional uh, or somebody on the team who thinks of, in terms of the, the hierarchy of the institution or people's titles or positions, but a real effective team, those kind of things ought to go away because if the team has been put together for a purpose, for the kinds of things that Andre mentioned earlier, everybody there has a, a, an important and legitimate role to play. And the, the team leader has to be able to set that tone as one of the, as one of the norms of, of the group. The other thing for me that's overarching and most important is uh, something that, that I learned early, early on in my career. Uh, and it's summed up in the phrase that people support what they help create. Uh, if you have some people there on a team who uh, don't feel that their position is valued, their, their ideas matter, uh, it's very easy for them to become disengaged. If everything that's happening is driven by the team chair or the leader, uh, you know, this is my agenda, this is what we think we ought to do, it's very easy for people not to be invested in that. And Again, if people understand that, that their, their contributions are valued, they're there because they have a contribution to make to the team, that, that sets the norm for the group. And these, again, these next points here, the challenges, gets back to what's the purpose of the team? What are they trying to accomplish? Uh, and the third bullet point on this slide, it was just one example of how you could look at that, depending on what the issue is. If, for example, a group is looking at an institutional policy that needs to be addressed, modified, developed, created, that's probably going to uh, require a certain, uh, certain members of, of the institution coming together versus looking at how operational procedures might be developed to implement a policy or procedure. It's kind of the way institutions look at the role of a board of trustees versus the administrative staff. And for example, we used to have a chairman of the board at one of the institutions where I worked who summed up the board's role, which was they should have their noses in but their fingers out, <laughs> which simply means they have to give the responsibility to the people at the institution to conduct the business of the institution. The other important bullet point here is do you have some people who might be involved who may not need to be? Uh, there could be some overlap of, of duties and responsibilities. Getting to identify, identifying who should be at the table, who the most uh, important people are, making sure that you have uh, all of the perspectives covered will go a long way to getting the team uh, to work effectively and ad address effectively uh, the issue that they're, that they're charged to address. 
and that if you'd like we can move into the next slide of scheduling a time to meet this is yeah or uh, Andre if you wanted to follow up on that before we do that whatever Yeah, the only thing that, that I would I apologize would for add. having some technical. Go ahead, Andre. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I would add to that uh, about kind of the um, defining the members is uh, a basic comment of kind of what I call feeding the team, and it's both literally and figuratively that when we define, so again, a time, a figuring out what level um, that Craig was saying of, of personnel do you need on the team to effectively address that, but then making sure that you take time to actually build the team, whether that is through training, um, and when I say that our stance here is feeding them, often what we do is we actually have lunch sessions um, that have a light agenda, but food, where people just start to get to know each other. That deals with that dynamic of maybe they have worked together, but they've never worked together in this setting, and they get to know each other more on a human level, um, and, and giving time for that team to kind of just build um, itself on, on that, that level, um, I think is, is really important. So it's not just identifying, you know, who needs to be there, but then once they're there, realizing maybe they work together, maybe they haven't, and even if they have worked together, did they ever work together in this context? And how do you create a work environment for them to be successful in that? So the short, um, just to sum that up a little bit, it sounds to me um, like the, the best process to use is one, figure out who should be at the table, but then once you've made that identification of these are the people that we need in order to accomplish a specific goal, um, spending time on building that team and building that group to make sure that you have um, core connections to one another and that you're able to really capitalize on one another's strengths and, and kind of, as you were saying, celebrate all of those different strengths and differences. Um, so Craig and Roger, we're going to move on to some of the more technical, somewhat tedious aspects, but a lot of them really do tie together and bring together some of these teams. You know, so much of what we talked about is how do we make sure that teams have purpose and how do we make sure that there's a structure that they feel as though they're working towards something else. Um, one of the comments that somebody had mentioned is that each session, each meeting should build upon one another. That was a really great comment from a participant so that everyone feels as though they're working towards the same goal. This meeting relates to the last meeting. Um, so if Craig and Roger, if you could just talk a little bit about something that seems as simple as scheduling time to meet, but that can often be one of our, our biggest challenges. Roger again, and in the interest of time, because I know we want to allow some time at the end for questions as well, I'll try to make my comments on this slide and, and the next one uh, very brief. It can be summed up with the phrase I just used a, bit, a minute ago, people support what they help create. How many of us have been sent an email or something identifying uh, the time and place of a meeting and there's no way we can be there. We might be out of town somewhere, whatever. What message does that send to the team members if there's not some cons consultation about when to meet so that, again, the people who you want there who have the different perspectives, the information to address the issues can be sure to be there. So with all the scheduling tools and meeting tools that we have available now electronically, it's most important to try to make, to send the message that, again, everybody's contribution is important. Let's try to get everybody there at the table. That's why they're, they've been designated to be a part of that group in the first place. And again, that translates over to the next slide of, of setting that agenda. If it's, if you're invested in that agenda, you're going to want to, be an active participant in that group as the issues are discussed. And as Craig mentioned before, for people who tend to be more introverted, they need some time to think and reflect on things. And if you if people can contribute to the agenda, identify the things that need to be there, and that agenda goes out in advance, that gives everybody on the team a chance to prepare, perhaps uh, do some additional research, bring some resources, to the team when it meets, perhaps send out information ahead of time that might contribute to the team working more effectively when it does get together. But if that agenda is not sent in advance or people aren't quite sure what's going to happen until they get there, 
it just diminishes the effectiveness of, of the meeting, and there, there's a lot of wasted time. Absolutely. And so, Andre, I was wondering if maybe you could share a little bit in terms of what you've seen from your particular group uh, in terms of drafting the agenda, scheduling. How did you make sure that everybody was on the same page? Fine. Is that we, so building off what, what Craig was saying, we're fortunate that we're in an environment now, it's both a, a double-edged sword, where we have a lot of technology that can help us with the scheduling and, and building agendas, but it also um, makes things more complicated. But what, what we have done is with the teams that, that we oversee is make sure that we, one, make, make a set kind of this is when we expect to meet and try to standardize that where we can, knowing that a lot of the, like whether it's the beta team or other incident response teams, knowing that you know, at 3 a.m. we might need to get together, but if, wherever we can, kind of normalize the schedule and expectations of when we'll meet, also setting that standard of, uh, a rolling agenda, so if something is on the agenda, doesn't get finished in one meeting, it goes to the next, always following through with meeting minutes. But the other part that I think has been really, really critical and actually been um, very successful for us is giving our teams a virtual space to work. And so what I mean by that, again, there's a lot of software platforms out there that are geared towards project management and different things, but setting up a virtual environment for the team so that if somebody's out of town or if somebody can't make a meeting or wants to chime in, this gets to that, that point again of they may not be comfortable in, in a meeting setting, but making different areas or ways in which people can uh, participate. And so for a lot of the things, and part of this has just been time constraints, uh, what we've done is we set up a virtual environment that serves as kind of a project management site for our teams. Um, so that again, you can find the last set of meeting minutes, any resources that you need. So prior to a meeting, you can go into that site, uh, see what the messaging or communication is around the topic, uh, but also um, it's that repository. So if you're not, you haven't been to a meeting in a week, two weeks or a month, you can log in and kind of get yourself up to speed. So it is kind of important to make sure that the, the team has multiple ways to chime in and feel that they're participating. And I 100% agree that teams are much more effective when they feel vested and they feel like they are part of something that whether that something is problem solving, uh, changing policy, um, moving something forward, but they are vested, they're heard, uh, and we're respecting their time. A little trick that I've always used to kind of de determine how important this is, is I start tailing up in my head. I work for a CFO, so I start tailing up in my head what a half hour meeting of 10 senior leadership members costs the institution that we often discount the time of the individual as a not true cost. It is a true cost. And for that, we want to be really conscious about how do we actually take the time to think through scheduling and setting agendas to maximize our efficiency when we actually are meeting in person. And then look at opportunities where do we always need to meet in person? Are there ways through a virtual environment that we can structure that uh, to make the team more effective, even if they are not physically eyeball to eyeball? Excellent. And I think what we've seen, especially in a lot of the work that we do and um, with collaborative members, we, we have a um, collaborative uh, uh, system in which institutions uh, can engage teams of, of normally five to seven individuals. And essentially, they, they dive into a, a year-long or multi-year um, engagement with the Clery Act and, and improving their own processes around Clery. But one of the things that we've seen, especially when working with collaborative members, is that this particular focus of looking at, one, who should be at the table, but also are there particular areas in which a subcommittee or a subteam might be able to explore doing a deep dive in one area in particular and bringing it back to the team. So really looking at how can we make this most productive and really engaging some of the different tools that you talked about, such as how can we incorporate um, online systems. There's so many different ways for facilitating meetings or um, for storing documents together that can be utilized more effectively. Uh, one of the things that I loved is that throughout the session, we've had people sharing some things about their own teams. Um, one in particular, we, we have um, someone who is talking about how the number of participants in his 
this particular team looking at National Campus Safety Awareness Month in particular um, has grown over years. So it started out as a smaller group and now it's um, built into a number of different projects, events, actions, initiatives, and activities. And it turned into a joint VAWA NACSAM with meetings and activities conducted year round and monthly, especially including the summer months. And so that's really an example of why we think teams are so important because we know that when they come together, they're able to accomplish so much more um, together. And so we had a number of different questions that we've been answering throughout, but I also just want to take these last couple of minutes for any lingering questions that are coming in, um, one of which was directed towards you, Andre. Um, you talked a little bit about how your team in particular uses Waiver 21, and they were wondering if you could just share a little bit more about what that is or, or kind of why you chose to use that tool. Sure. Um, so the, the Waiver 21 is uh, basically a standard methodology for doing behavioral evaluation and threat assessments. It is a series of, of questions. There's a number um, of different methodologies out there. One of the reasons that we picked this one is it's more prevalent on the West Coast. Um, and with some of the, um, where we're headed with assessment, what we're really trying to do is work community-wide. Um, and so we not only picked the, the Waiver 21, process and methodology, and if you go online and Google it, you can, can find it. Uh, Dr. White and one of his colleagues um, out of, oh, I forget if it's Berkeley or Stanford, um, were kind of the key in, in writing this. Um, but what we're again looking at is a methodology that sets up 21 questions that um, you can take a team through, and again, having law enforcement, um, you know, your uh, psychology or uh, mental health professionals, all the different players, but these questions kind of help you kind of go through um, a full-out assessment of, of a case. And again, that could be student, faculty, um, or community. So we chose Waiver 21 because of the proximity and the use on the West Coast because the key is we want to be using a methodology that other campuses within the state are using, but more importantly, we're trying to work with our community college and supporting even our um, uh, some of our other private institutions around that we, we wind up sharing cases. So the more that we're using a standard methodology helps us. And again, the navigation, meaning um, the, the legal ramifications of not doing this right are significant, but there's also a lot around what information can be shared um, from institution to institution. And so that's why what we're trying to do is set up a, a standard platform. Um, but um, the Sigma group is another group. There's another methodology out of there that um, Dr. Dreisinger from uh, Virginia Tech was instrumental in, in developing. Um, so it was really to set a standard platform for us, and then I'm happy to talk offline or um, push people in the right direction for those types of resources because um, there's some really good resources out there. So figuring out what tool is going to be best for, for what you're trying to do. Actually, the next question that just came in is for you as well, Andre, which is, what processes did you use to select team members for your specific team? So the, again, going back to the methodology, we had um, kind of a, a team that was uh, loosely uh, meeting on these types of issues. So we started with that. And then we did uh, kind of a reflection based upon the types of questions that we would need to ask and also um, the um, information we would need to have in kind of processing this problem. So it's we looked at who was already meeting. And so normally when these cases kind of popped up, we would have law enforcement engaged. We would have our counseling center engaged, um, sometimes academic affairs. But again, it was kind of a hodgepodge. Um, and so what we did was looking at, okay, if we want a team that for the purpose is able to address not only student issues, but faculty, staff, and community, that really then helped educate, okay, which leadership um, from the campus do we need to have? And so our team then broadened out that we have now, you know, um, a, a vice provost from our academic affairs. Again, we have counseling, testing, police chief, human resources, general counsel. We're general counsels there more to guide us through the legal navigation of everything from FERPA to HIPAA to Cleary and other things. Um, we also then have affirmative action at the table. Again, those are more of kind of they're navigating, oh, well, you're talking about this. What would be the ramifications um, from a legal? Um, we also then have our labor relations, risk management, um, emergency management um, at the table. And again, there's kind of what I consider primary, meaning people that are actually managing or doing the caseload. 
um, and then there are secondary members that are more the technical expertise on legal issues and any actions that we're proposing to make sure that they're, they're one um, compliant but also um, duly kind of uh, structured to address the threat at hand um, and that we're not going overboard on something or not taking something seriously enough. Thank you. So on the screen you see a number of different resources. You know, we, when we reached out to panelists and asked them what some of the key resources are that they use and that they found helpful within their work, um, these are what they shared. So I know that you received the PowerPoint slides. Um, if for some reason you didn't get those, you will also receive a follow-up email that will have a link to access the recording of this webinar. So you'll be able to go back through, um, look at these resources, and certainly find what's going to be a good fit for you moving forward. As we mentioned, we're also in the process of really building additional resources for National Campus Safety Awareness Month. Um, our goal is to really make them as relevant as possible to the work that you're doing and to the needs that you have. Um, so as part of that, we are going to have, as we always do for our webinars, an evaluation um, that, that my colleague is going to link out any moment. And what we would love for you to do is just share your thoughts on this webinar. What did you enjoy? What are some things that you'd like to see in the future? Um, and in terms of topics that you would like to see for National Campus Safety Awareness Month, we've had a lot of feedback um, in terms terms of things like the intersection of Cleary and Title IX, um, looking at issues such as hazing or sexual violence on campus. So we have a number of different things that we're already in the process of putting together, but we'd love any feedback that you have on this webinar or on other things that are going to be useful to you. As we mentioned, everything that we develop is going to be available for free, so all you have to do is use that link um, in the sign panel and that's listed on the screen, um, and you can sign up to, to receive those resources throughout September. Um, and we know that September is a busy month, so if you need to access them after the fact, we'll also be able, if you sign up, to um, make sure that you have that for whatever time in the year is going to be best for you. I just want to thank all of our panelists for joining us here today. It was a really wonderful discussion. I appreciated all of the feedback that you gave throughout the session in terms of what was working on your own teams, what challenges you were having, and some of the questions that you had. Um, again, if there are other topics related to this or separate that you want us to dive into, please let us know. This is a great opportunity um, for the Clery Center to really bring together some of the leaders in the field, like we've done for this, um, to make some resources that are going to be most helpful to you. Um, so other than that, just thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Please take the time to fill out the evaluation and we will certainly hopefully get to connect with you soon and especially during National Campus Safety Awareness Month in September. Thank you so much.